Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Full Quota Podcast. My name is Mpo Mutwani. I've got Tim Del Lace here with me, next to me. Uh, we've got an interesting conversation to happen today. Um, remember, the Proteas are in New Zealand right now. They're going through their quarantines. I think they're out of their quarantine right now. Um, and so they're getting ready for the first test that starts from week Thursday um, at about 11.30 South African time. So uh, be ready for late nights and night shifts from our One World Sports Radio team. Well done to them for covering the India Series and the West Indies Women's Series. And so, Tim, we've got a guest today to discuss Test Cricket, to discuss the Proteas in New Zealand. Who do we have today, Tim? We have a uh, cricket analyst from New Zealand. Um, it said it was a good, good chance for him to come on the show. He uh, he knows his, he knows his cricket well. He knows his New Zealand cricket well. Um, he's in he's in New Zealand at the moment, so it seemed like a good opportunity. We always get somebody um, on who we South Africa are playing, so it seemed like a good opportunity to get Adam Bell on. Okay, so let's bring Adam Bell on. Um, to to discuss all things. Hi, Adam. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. That's good. That's awesome. So, uh, Adam, I think for me, obviously, we're looking forward to that uh, to the test series between the Proteas as well as the Black Caps of New Zealand in New Zealand. It's been a long time. 2018. I was thinking about that test series. I'm thinking that South Africa took um, Stephen Cook, opened with Stephen Cook, and he got dropped in that series. But the one thing that was that was imp- imp- thing interesting for me was Ross Taylor played in that series, but this time Ross Taylor won't be there. And this is the first series without Ross Taylor. So how's the New Zealand team, or how's New Zealand feeling about life after Ross Taylor? Quite interesting because Ross Taylor's been having, well, before he retired, was had, had a bit of a lean patch in the last couple of years of his career. And we all expected that Kane Williamson would come back from his elbow injury. Uh, which means that, you know, he would come into Ross Taylor's spot and then Will Young would stay in opener and then Devin Conway would just slip into Ross Taylor's position in the middle of it. And now um, Kane Williamson has to come back. So now we've got like essentially got to replace two players now. So, um, look, I think when I look at the New Zealand batting order at the moment, it looks a little little thin. I, I was reading a um, stat the other day. This is the first time, I think, since two, sorry, 2008 that New Zealand don't have either... Kane Williamson, Ross Taylor, and in, in, te- in the test team. That's crazy. You know, 13 years with either one of those two or both of them in, in the test side. So when I look at um, Ross Taylor and um, absence from the New Zealand side, I think it's a huge loss. I know he hasn't been in great, well, he wasn't in great form um, for the last few years up until his retirement, but I think just ha- having him around the dressing room and his presence on the side will be sorely missed. Yes, yeah, so that's a really an interest, intriguing one. Um, Tim, You've probably got a whole list of questions, so let me allow you to come through, and then we'll 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 pepper Adam like uh, Mitch Sand, uh, like uh, uh, Trent Bolt and 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 Tim Sabi. Yeah. Okay. Um. Just just on on the actual squad. So, what are your thoughts on the on the actual squad that, that was announced? Um. And with those guys missing out, um, just give us a bit of a flavour of of the two new guys that, that are there. Fletcher and uh, Tickner, what what are their roles? What are they likely to be doing? Uh, will they both play, or will one of them play? Yeah, what what is what is expected? I I think both guys will be in the squad. I don't think they'll be guys that will make the eleven. And um, Cam Fletcher is an interesting one. He's been around New Zealand domestic cricket for quite a while now. He averages thirty seven with the bats, got six uh, first class um, centuries. And he's, I think, 27 years of age now. He's a wicketkeeper batsman. And I think with BJ Watling retiring and after the, the World Test Championship and Tom Blundell not really seizing his chance, and Cam Fletch has been a guy that's been really knocking on the door in domestic cricket over the last few years, more more so in the white ball formats. He, he's been fantastic in um, the T20 competition over in New Zealand. And, and he's really made a name for himself in that competition, played some incredible knocks. So he has been someone that's been obviously knocking on the door. And, and I think with New Zealand going through a bit of a transition period, you know, in, in particular spots, you know, the opening position, um, obviously Ross Taylor now retiring, and with Blundell not quite, you know, filling in to BJ Watling's spot, I think there's always going to be a, a few opportunities for new players to, to, to push their claims. 
Um, and I think Cam Fletcher is one. Um, better see now, obviously, as being the second best wicket keeper um, in the country. Um, Blair Tickner is also on the squad. He's been around the New Zealand setup for a little while now. Um, he's made more of a mark in, again, white ball cricket, which again is interesting. Um, he's played a few T20s for New Zealand. Um, hasn't really taken his opportunities in the shorter formats. Um, he is around 30 years of age, a guy that's been on the domestic circuit for a long time, averages 35 with a ball, which when you, on the face of it aren't impressive figures compared to a lot of other guys in the country. However, he's a guy that's improved a lot over the last few years. When he came on the scene in, in New Zealand domestic cricket, he was bowling you know, early 130s. Uh, but now he's, he's he's able to bowl you know, upper 130s and into the early 140s. So he's a guy that's, um, he's a tall guy, gets a lot of bounce, and he's really worked on up, up, upping his pace. So he's become a, a lot better proposition over the last few years. So we see the return in your squad of Colin de Grandom as well as Hamish Rutherford, who hasn't played in like seven years. It's, it was a blast from the past when we saw his name come through. Um, obviously, de Grandom played in that World Test Championship. Um a final, but uh, I wouldn't see him after that. Um, and obviously, Hamish Rutherford coming in. Are they guys who are going to be fighting for spots, or are they? It's just it, it's just a reward for a great season because I'm hearing Hamish Rutherford is just uh, scoring 370, 300 plus runs in four matches that side. I'll, I'll firstly I'll mention Colin Gromhorn because he's a real interesting mm. one because. Before the World Test Championship, there was a period where he was out of cricket for, for a while due to injury, and his form completely dropped off. Um, and even in the World Test Championship, you know, from memory, he was one of the um, the worst bowlers. You know, he, he, he leaked a lot of runs, and he, he really didn't do his job with battle ball. And um, he's got back into the squad, and I, I feel as if it's based on the fact that the two Test matches are at Hagley Oval and Christchurch, um, and traditionally the pitches there have been a little on, on the green side. I remember his test debut against Pakistan where he got a five-booker bag and 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 also, you know, test against India where he was also, um, oh, sorry, against Pakistan where he was also, you know, troubling um, the, the the batsman because he's so good at getting the ball to move um, off the pitch on green pitches. Um, he's an interesting one because he hasn't really, again, been setting the world on fire in our first-class scene over the last few months. Um, he's done well in our T20 competition as well. And I guess that's another fact with, with New Zealand selection that for a lot of the, the fringe players mm -hmm. is New Zealand cricketers at the moment have been playing a diet of short-form cricket. Um, our Plunkett Shield, which is our four-day competition, only resumed a week or so ago. So a lot of these guys haven't really played a lot of four-day cricket leading into this test series. So I think with Colin de Gromholm, I think it was based a little bit on, on the fact that um, he is someone that can fit in, there, obviously, in the all-rounder role. He's, he knows um, Hagley Oval well. Mm. He's performed there in the past. Um, and I think they see him as, as being someone that can can slip into the, that all-rounder role. And I think what this suggests also is Daryl Mitchell has, has held the spot um, for, for a few test matches, um, in particular against Pakistan last season at home. And I think this is this is a big indication that Daryl Mitchell could actually play as a specialist batsman in the middle order, replacing Ross Taylor, and then Colin McGromholm actually playing as the... Um, the the seeming all rounder. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Which gets me onto the the actual pitch. What are you expecting from the pitch? Um South Africa have got two spinners in their squad. Um they don't want the pick. other spinner to play two. So I, 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 don't I, know. I do I do. I do. Uh, you have got I would argue you've got half of a one. I wouldn't necessarily call Bavindra a spinner, I would no. more call him a batsman who can bowl a bit. So, does that mean you don't they don't expect it to be conducive to spin? Uh, historically, early on in particular, Hagley Oval has been uh, he's been, been a feast for for medium pace to fast bowlers. It's always been green pitches. So, you know, it's interesting that South Africa bring over two spinners. I'm not sure what what sort of information they've got um, from from the spies in New Zealand. Um, obviously, it's you know it's a two test series. Um, there's COVID. Um, you've got to have a, a, a certain number um, in case anything happens. So I mean, I think Harm is an interesting one bringing him back. Um, obviously, he's been killing it for the Essex over the last three or four seasons. So it's actually really good to see him back. But it is interesting that 
um, two spinners have been selected. Where in New Zealand, um, we've only selected, as you, as you point out, a spinning all-rounder, not a specialist spinner. Well, Adam, we actually have three spinners in the side. The one of them is Aidan Markham, and currently he is in the side as a as a spinner. We just haven't <laughs> used him in Test cricket yet. Um, Devon Conway is someone who I've gotten to know uh, for a couple of years in my life, and I'm really happy that he's playing international cricket. Uh, I've, I think he's one of the most exciting batters I've ever seen uh, play bat live, um, and that was when he was still a child. Um, how have New Zealand taken to Devon? How has his rise up into that New Zealand side uh, been? And yeah, like how important is he to you? Because I, I know he scores the runs, but like, how, what's the feeling that side about it? I, I would argue with, with Kane Williamson, now not on the New Zealand side, he's New Zealand's best batsman. Wow. I, and, 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 I, and, I, and I understand Tom Latham is an incredible batsman, but you think about the numbers that Devon Conway have already has already brought up for New Zealand and only such a short career. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. You know, I followed Devon Conway a lot before he made the New Zealand side, and, and I was really excited about him playing for New Zealand. I mean, he's averaging, I think it was 50 in all formats in New Zealand cricket at, at one point. But the way he's taken to, to test cricket has been rather phenomenal. I mean, to get a double set on your test debut is pretty much out of this world, and he just hasn't looked back. And I think the one thing I like about Devon Conway is his ability to really assess situations. He seems like a guy that's really composed, that knows his game. Mm. Obviously, being 30 years of age now, um, he's got a world experience, um, so he's not like a young person. Who, he's just making his mark in, 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 in test cricket. He's someone that's actually got a lot of experience. He knows his game really well. Um, and I think it just shows you how much he's worked on his game You know, for since he started domestic cricket in South Africa, through coming up through the ranks in New Zealand. He, he's someone that's really had to, to work hard to get to where he's got to. And I think it shows you that all that work that he's put on has really bear the fruits now. He's started playing international um, cricket because he just doesn't seem to be someone that is overawed in any, any situation. Um, you know, even he struggled a little bit in the T20 World Cup. However, even there were signs that he was able to kind of get himself out of some mm. of those situations. I think in particular... Um, in the uh, the semi final against England, where he played a, a really supporting innings to um, Daryl Mitchell, so he's just a, a guy that for me is just not only technically good, but just knows how to to read the situation in the game. And I, I kind of thought about him as being someone akin to someone like Michael Hussey, and mm. and I see that kind of in the shorter form of the game as well because he's someone that can really explode when he needs to. And yes. You know, like Michael Hussey, who was able to not only play that graft in innings when he needed to and dig in, but in shorter forms, Michael Hussey could explode out of nowhere. Um, and he could always read a situation. And I kind of feel that Devin Conway has a lot of those attributes. And the fact that Michael Hussey also batted in the middle order, also opened the batting, um, similar to, to Devin also Conway. Also made his Devin debut Conway, at 29. Yeah. Yeah, debut late as well, you know. Um, and, and I think it kind of shows you with those guys... Um, maybe there is a case for letting guys just get experience in domestic cricket, not chucking mm. guys in at 21 years of age and expect them to to, to be great right away. Because when we think about great players, um, you know, there's only a handful of guys that really explode onto the scene and end up being great straight away. And, and mm. they're normally prodigious talents. Um, so I think sometimes we expect a lot from, from younger players. Where You know, as I mentioned, Devin Conway, Hussey and, and other guys. So we're going off topic a little bit here. Um, no, Rassi van der Dissen is also a player in that, Ross, in that ilk as well. Yeah. Um, debut late to 29, man for all situations for South Africa, even though Tim wants him to bat a little bit faster in, 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 in test cricket. But it, and, and I'm a fan of that, and I really do. I really enjoyed Devin's um, journey through. I obviously wanted him to play a little bit earlier in international cricket, but that never came out. Um, and I'm happy that he's one of the... The, the top batters that you that New Zealand sees him as like without Kane Williamson he's the guy. It's just quite it's quite interesting because uh, it's 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 that whole Devon scoring runs against South Africa that I'm have to deal with, um, but I'll be okay with that if even if he scores a century that's okay. Uh, I'll give him one, but not not two or three <laughs> somehow in this test series. <laughs> no, I, 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 no, I'm just gonna say the, 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 the story. Well. Yeah, Wagner's gone. Like we, 
We've let him go. It's okay. <laughs> it's been years. He's played against us, so that's fine. It's just having because I because coming out of of, of 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 high school, I thought Devin was gonna make it big. I thought he was one of the next big players who was gonna be fast tracked through the system because of the way he played. And he somehow lost that rhythm and he lost um sight of, of what made him so good as a child. Um, and, and that happens because that's what cricket is. You fail, you 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 score runs, you, you you question yourself whether you're good. And he went through a lot of that. And I'm just happy that he found a place in the world where it allowed him to, you know, where nobody knew who he was, allowed him to play cricket. And you can now start to see the devastating Devon that I grew up watching um, now. And so that that for me is, is great. It's just obviously now it's one of those situations where um, – We've lost him, but I know why we've lost him, and I'm happy for that. Instead of necessarily Tim's friends, there, Sam Harmon's walking away mid-season, be like, I'm, I'm going somewhere else, and then choosing to play for England, and then and then wanting to come back because of some some political drama that happened that side. But anyway, um, Tim, you had a question. See, Adam, this is what I this is why we did the podcast to have arguments. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and I often have arguments. It's good. No, it's good. It's good. Um, on just on that. So you said now that the the, the pressure is on Conway to score runs because of Karen and Ross are being out of the squad. Who does the pressure fall on in terms of the bowlers with Bolton not being there? From what you say, it sounds like it's going to lead on to Salvi more than the Wagner. But uh, would that be correct? Uh, yes, I, I think I think those two guys um, now will spearhead the, the attack. Obviously, Kyle Jamison is there waiting in the wings as well. I mean, what a start he's had to his um, test career. And um, obviously, his averages have kind of starting to normalise somewhat, um, especially after that series in India. Um, he's starting to look human again. Um, but I think those three guys should be able to shoulder a lot of the, the overs for New Zealand. And I think that's where someone like Colin de Gromholm, if the pitch is a little bit green, um, could really come into his own. Uh, but, I mean, Tim Salvi in test career, in, sorry, in test cricket for the last few years has been absolutely outstanding. In fact, you probably say he's been New Zealand's overall best test bowler. And I, I still, for some reason, rate Trent Bolt higher than him. Um, mm. I feel like Trent Bolt is that kind of guy that, that can really um, open up a game. And oh, yes. not saying Tim Salvi's not a fantastic bowler, but for some reason, I just always feel that Trent Bolt's that kind of bowler that, that can get the vital wicket when New Zealand needs to. Um, and I think Neil Wagner, I guess, is a little bit in the same boat. But I think when you think about results over the last few years in terms of consistency, I think I think Tim Salvi has been absolutely out outstanding. And, um, you know, he'll be wanting to um, get higher up on the, the New Zealand wicket tally as well. Like, he, I'm not sure how many more wickets he's behind Richard Hadley, but, I mean, he's, what, um, I think 33 now. Um, who knows? Maybe he could break Sir Richard Hadley's record at one point. Yeah, so that's an interesting one because where if you're Tom Latham, what what part of the game um, gives you sleepless nights? Um, what part of this team? What where's the weak spots in this team um, that Tom Latham would be worried about? Well, uh, interesting that you say that because when I think about Tom Latham as a captain, he's been involved in three big losses, mm. and one was in Australia. Um, uh, and I guess in fairness to him, New Zealand were decimated by injuries. Um, but in his first test captaincy, was, New Zealand was stumped by Australia. Um, against India recently, um, New Zealand was stumped with him as captain. Um, and that, mm. that famous test match where um, AJ Patel got a team wicket bag by New Zealand and that match got absolutely outplayed in, in that mm. test match. And then more recently, which will give South African fans a lot of hope, uh, New Zealand Bangladesh. got beaten by Bangladesh, which was... Absolutely incredible. And um, so this New Zealand side does have some holes in it at, at the moment. You know, with Kane Williamson not there, with BJ Watling, who was always the rock at number seven, if New Zealand got off to a bad start, we always knew where BJ Watling at number seven, who would grind it out, who could work with a tail, who could get New Zealand out of trouble. But without him there, without Kane Williamson there, I feel as if New Zealand lacks a lot of solidity at the moment in, in the batting lineup. Um, obviously, Ross Taylor, though he hasn't been in the run or wasn't in the runs leading up to retiring, is still a massive loss due to his, his experience. Um, so I think at the moment, New Zealand still, there is a little bit of an underbelly, I think, 
with the New Zealand batting lineup. Henry Nichols hasn't really been um, in great form over recent Test matches as well. Um, Will Young, though he's had an impressive start to his Test career, um, he's still inexperienced. Um, Daryl Mitchell, I think I mentioned that he'll come into the, into the batting lineup, mm-hmm. and he has played some good knocks over the last few seasons, but he's not Kane Williamson. And you take any great player out of the batting lineup, and it does leave a massive, massive hole. And I think not only is Kane Williamson an, an incredible batsman, an amazing captain, as, as we've seen, I think he just gives the rest of the team a lot of confidence. And we've seen that with, with the matches where Tom Latham is captain New Zealand have been soundly beaten. Not only did we miss Kane Williamson's batting, but I think also his influence on the team. Wow. That's, uh, yeah. that, that's, uh, that's reminding me of India. Um, yeah. India somehow yeah. ended up <laughs> like that. Um, and it well, felt like in that India series, Rohit Sharma was the, the guy they missed. Um, and, and South Africa, it, it kind of leveled the playing fields a little bit. Yeah, indeed. What what is good, what is in your in your favour there is Tom Latham's record at Hartley Over. He's played all nine nine of the test matches that have been played there. New Zealand have lost one of them, one of those nine, and he averages fifty seven. His 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 batting in the last couple of years has been re, it's really improved, particularly the last couple of years. Is there any reason why that's happened? Is he, is he just got more more mature or what? I think he's just got more experience. I and mean, he's always been a, a fine player and a really talented batsman um, across all formats. But I think he's he's really just knows his game now. He, he's a patient batsman. I think he's been part of a, a winning combination. I think when you're part of a, a winning combination, it r- really helps as well. He probably doesn't have the same kind of pressure as he as as, as other players do who are in, in weaker sides. And you know, we talk about the New Zealand you know bowling up being so successful over the last few seasons. I guess that flows on into batting as well. If you're getting teams out cheaply and then you're going out to bat, you probably don't have the same pressure on you as if, if, if you're bowling on it that's given away 500 runs and you've got to come and you've got to save the match with, with fielders around the bat and so much pressure on you. So I think he's just been part of a, a really great New Zealand unit, but I think he's just really taken his game to another another level. And it, and the series in Bangladesh where he, he kept in the T20 side, his keeping in that um, was exceptional. He's not a, a full-time wicket t- keeper for the Black Caps, but it kind of just showed you his all-round cricketing ability that he's a guy that can you know field in the slips one of the best slip fieldsmen in New Zealand and um, a, a terrific wicket keeper and with a bat can bat in all, all positions so I mean he like he's for me he's one of the best uh, test batsmen in the uh, test opening batsmen not one of the best batsmen mm. one of the best um, opening bats in the world along with Alga along with Karuna Ratna um, of those three guys in particular um, for me stand out as, as three of the, the best at the moment Adam, what's the expectation from New Zealand with this series with South Africa? What uh, what do how, is it? Is it a two 0 Is it a one um, one? What, what do you want from what do well the people around there? What do you want uh, from this New Zealand side um, coming into the series? You know, it's a really interesting series for for a lot of reasons. And I mentioned a term um, off air before we started that New Zealand's never beaten South Africa in a Test series. And we think about where New Zealand cricket has been recently, World Test Championships. When you think about the New Zealand side, probably the best New Zealand side um, that's ever been produced. Then we look on 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 the other end, we look at the South African side at the moment, which I don't want to be disrespectful to the South, Afri- the South African side at the moment, but it's not the strongest side mm. that South Africa have ever produced. Um, so when you put all those factors together, it really creates an interesting series because you think of you think that this would be the best opportunity for New Zealand to beat South Africa in a test series. Um I know that um Kane's not there and BJ Watland's mm-hmm. recently retired, but all things considered at home, this would be one of New Zealand's best opportunities to beat South Africa. No QDK recently retired, you know, one of the best wicket keeper batsmen in Test cricket just retired. And um, obviously Keegan Peterson is not um, in the in the squad mm-hmm. due to COVID. South Africa going through a rebuilding stage as well. So when you think about it, this would be New Zealand's best opportunity. However, the one thing for me that I that I really love about the series is there are a lot of unknowns that will, that are about to be answered. Um, I've been following South Africa over the last you know few months, in particular Marco Jansen, um, and just seeing <laughs> his impact 
has been incredible. Another giant, isn't he? Another Cole Jamison giant out there. You know, you guys got your own. 19 <laughs> wickets against India. And, you know, he's a bit of an un unknown quantity. And, and and Tom Latham struggled against left arm um, fast bowlers as well. Um, so that matchup will be interesting. Um, Rabana is still one of the best test bowlers in the world. Um, Nokia as well, you know, fast and furious. We know the kind of talent he possesses. I saw um, Sturman against India Ray. Um, bowl kind of yeah. philanderous. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, uh, he's, a, he's a good bowler as well. Um, obviously, Dwayne Olivier has come back into the fold as well. Um, you know, we've got Harmer. So there's enough quality in that South African bowling lineup to really trouble the New Zealand batting lineup. And obviously, Kevin Peterson was the um, the batsman of the series for South Africa mm. against India, and he's going to be a huge loss. But I think Dean Alga is going to really um, shoulder a lot of responsibility in the series. And I think it's probably, from a South African perspective, it's probably time for Aidan Markram. To, to really um, <laughs> score some runs as well because he started off incredibly into his cricket. We remember that series against Australia and he's kind of fallen away. But it's funny because on the flip side of it, his T20 betting has kind of risen up. You know, um, yeah. he's fantastic in the T20 World Cup. So, you know, there's still enough quality in, in your side that like that can trouble New Zealand. So in terms of expectations... Um, it's, it's a hard one because I feel as if South Africa are a really unknown quantity. And you guys beat India at home as well. And that Indian side went to Australia and beat Australia. So, I already answered it. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many comments about that India victory because I honestly think India were very complacent um, in when they came here. Cause, and and, and that's, it gives me a feeling of, of, of that Bangladesh loss where it felt to me that New Zealand got into a complacent period or a complacent area, and they thought they always beat uh, Bangladesh, so they thought they'd come through. Whereas with India, you kind of felt like they came to South Africa with a better batting lineup, a better bowling lineup, and somehow they just thought they'd just arrive and things would just open up for them. Um, so that's why I kind of feel like South Africa, yes, the unknown quantity, uh, but you, like you can pretty much, this team hasn't scored 250 like over 250 in a test innings and like, well, it's twice in like the last three years or, or four, four. I'll give them like three in the last three years because that innings at the Wanderers could have been over 300, but they don't do that. And so that's my biggest issue. So Africa's first innings always been a problem. So I think New Zealand actually should come out and, and do that. The only problem I have, the only thing I have is the pitches that had had the oval give, bring Kahiso in, bring Mark Janssen into the game. They bring Duan Oliveira into the game. They also bring Alungin Gidi into the game. And so that's going to be where, because that's essentially what South Africa wanted, wanted to do to beat India, was let's let our fast bowlers dictate where this test series is going to go. And they did quite well. Whereas now we're coming to New Zealand. And yes, New Zealand has a better batting lineup than South Africa, and they should bat South Africa out the game. But if this bowling attack can just get a, 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 a spell, a uh, a moment or, or or get those two early wickets, get get into get Conway out, get Latham out, get into that little soft dish under Bailey's not too soft, um, of New Zealand and South Africa find themselves into and that's what happened with, with that India series. The moment Rahul went out, the moment Veracoli went out, it kind of started to unravel. Um but from a tier World Test Championship perspective, New Zealand have to win this to try and get themselves back up there. They do, they do. You know, um, obviously losing in, um, that, t that test match in India and, and at home against Bangladesh, an opponent that you'd expect that you would get maximum points. It, it's put New Zealand now on, on, on the back foot. And, and I think this is a massive, massive series, as, as you point out. You know, South Africa have beaten a very, very good Indian side at home now. Um, and they wouldn't have expected probably to, or maybe the players probably, but most fans wouldn't have expected um, the series to go the way it did, especially after after the first test match where we were India one. So, look, this is massive. This is crucial. And and interesting that you talk about you know the South African bowling lineup. And I didn't forget Nagidi. That's how many quality bowlers that you've got in your squad at the moment. And um, if it ends up being a shootout between bowlers, and if the pitches are green, it could really even up the game. Because I think when I look at the advantages of of, of the New Zealand side compared to the South African side at the moment. New Zealand probably pips them in the batting, I would, I'd, I'd say, you know, mm -hmm. based on experience, home conditions. However, yeah. if the pitches are green, it'll bring the South African bowlers into the game. 
Um, and we've seen Marco Johnson and having an impact straight away. And, and, and we've, we've pointed out the great bowlers that you guys have and that mm. you can utilize pitches that have seen movement. A lot of the, the you know teams from Asia, for example, when they come over here, they struggle a little bit, even in green conditions. But I think I think South Africa in particular are expert at using the conditions well, in particular in New Zealand. I think that's why they've had so much success in New Zealand in, in the past because though South African pitches tend to be quicker as a whole, I think they're more used to bowling at fuller length on pitches mm. that, that are green steamers. And I think if it are, if the pitches are green, I think it really evens up the contest. And I think we can expect to see um, two really, really good test matches. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Which gets us down to the nitty gritty prediction. What is your prediction for the series? At, uh, Before that, Tim, can I just ask, yeah. when the toss, green top at Hagley Oval, what do you do? Because our fans are going to ask us that. I think you bowl first. Okay, so you don't bat first. I, I think you I think you stay away from batting. I think I think you stay, I think you just I think you just <laughs> you don't even contemplate it. Okay. Interesting. You heard that yet? First. Bowl first. <laughs> so <laughs> first yes, um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, score prediction and um maybe a sort of a surprise package, a player that you think people have not thought of that, that could have a real impact on the series. Um, okay, I th- I'm going to go one-one. I think it'll be a really hard-fought series. I-, I think the fact that New Zealand's ever beaten South Africa in a test series also adds a bit of spice to the series as well. There'll be a lot of pressure on us. Um, the player that I'm really looking forward to watching, and I've only watched clips of him, and I've mentioned him a few times already. Mm-hmm. I think Marco Johnson. I think the Battle of the Giants. That's what I'm looking <laughs> forward to. Um, and he bowled exceptionally well against India. And, and the one thing that I really enjoyed from the clips I saw from him in the series against India is he was aggressive. Um, yes. And a lot of young guys, especially when they start out bowlers, it can be quite timid at times. And he, he had a bit of an off um, ser- or off test match, um, the first test match against India, especially in the first innings, and um, when he, he went for a few runs. But after that, um, you know, he just he came back so strong and, and what a series from him. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the New Zealand batsmen go against a guy who's as tall as Jameson, that gets the same kind of bounce, um, and that bowls fast and that's aggressive. Um, because he'll put a lot of pressure on the New Zealand batting lineup, I feel. Um, you know, obviously, Rabada is the obvious one as well. So th- those two guys in, in particular um, are the players I'm looking forward to, to watching from South Africa. Who breaks the series open? Who is the player that New Zealand need to perform to win it to not. Mm, inter- interesting, because I always feel like you need a bowler, you know, to, to be the one that really breaks open games. Um, I, I feel Cole Jameson needs to have a big series for New Zealand mm-hmm. to win. Um, and as I mentioned, his, his averages have kind of normalised a little bit um, over the last few test matches. I mean, he's still averaging well under 20, but... I think at one point he's averaging you know, 12 or 13. So I think he is one guy that um, could really break the series open. Um, and we know the the start that he's had to his test career. Um, so I think he's going to be the one for me that would be the key for, for New Zealand in the series. Do you have any questions for us regarding South Africa? Anything you want to find out um, from our end? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been following South Africa a lot over the last couple of seasons, and I've seen obviously the big names that have left your team. Um, but you're still putting up great performances, which is which is really good. And I thought that you were unmightily unlucky in the T20 mm. World Cup um, not to progress. I thought um, the way you guys bounced back after that first game against uh, sorry, against Australia was was it was was phenomenal. And I think I mentioned um, Markram being um, mm. a fine performer in that in that World Cup. You know. Incredible strike rate for me, one of the batters of the tournament. But I guess I'd like to know what players from South Africa should we look out for? Um, I see Rickleton is in the team, who's got an incredible first class average, and I, I mentioned to Tim Yanam and Milan, who who's got a, a great first class record as well. What other guys are floating around that um, we can look forward to seeing? Well, I think the guy who's going to take Keegan Peterson's spot to Sardal Avia, 
Um, but I think Tim might disagree with me because I don't think Rickleton's going to see that side anytime soon because he's a reserve wicket keeper, uh, yeah. which is a shame uh, and a testament to the type of coaching we have. Um, uh, I, I, I agree that that's going to happen. I don't agree that it should yeah. happen, but that's what's going to happen. Yes. So sarvel has been in the domestic side. He scored a lovely, I think it was, uh, it was a half century. I think it was a 70s against India on a flat track um, in, 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 in Bloom in the same team as Yanaman Milan. He's the prospective opener or top order batter to come in should Keegan be out. Um, but there could be surprises. <laughs> yeah, you never know because they've got Zubair Hamza on tour. We've also got Ryan Rickleton who averaged 93 before the last round of of games. He also scored a century, I think, at in Newlands, Tim, um, in that final four-day round of four-day fixtures. He's he's the one I would like to see in the side, and I'd, I'd push for him. But saro has been there. He's travelled the team for two years. He's been their backup, so he should uh, get a spot. Um, Temba Bavuma is someone who I know he toured New Zealand before, um, but he's had somewhat of a renaissance since being dropped in that England series and coming back into the side. He's averaged 50. Um, he averages uh, he averaged uh, over 50 in that India series. He was the highest, the guy with the highest average. Obviously, King Bison had the most runs. Um, he is important to this team. If South Africa is going to win this series, it's him and Rassi van der Dissen who need to. Uh, bid down and, and lock down and, and bat New Zealand out the game. Um, and and but but the question for South Africa has always been what to do with um, number seven, position number seven. And um, right now we're going in with a we went in with a six five uh, split trying to keep a, a, a spinner. And and that brings in a guy like a Marco Janssen from a batting perspective. But I wouldn't be surprised if Vian Mulder came in again. Um, even though uh, he's young, he's he has all the talent in the world. It's just he needs time. He needs he needs to bake in domestic cricket. But right now, South Africa's searching for that all rounder who because like I look at him and I'm like, he's a poor man's Colin de Grando. You know, he can't give he gives me everything with the ball, but doesn't give me anything with the bat. Um, and he's gonna he could do well on these pitches because he gets a lot of swing and everything else. So for me, that's the one thing. But um a lot of guys in South Africa are obviously waiting in the wings. Um, Yanaman's waiting for his opportunity. So his brother got an opportunity, Peter, but he never got one back. Um, you've got Zubair Hamza who's on tour. Um, and obviously, we're still dealing with a lot of people like Tim's favorite, uh, favorite friend, David Beddingham, who decided to leave and go and be an England player. So there are some guys sitting at home, but I think they, the one guy everyone needs to watch out for, the unknown quantity from myself and everyone else, is Saval Advia because he's going to be making his debut. And nobody knows how that step up is between domestic and international. The fundamentals are there, but you just never know. And he's in and out because obviously Keegan Peterson, that's Keegan Peterson's spot. The, the only how thing about guys. Oh, sorry. I'll, so I'll just add, I'll just add, Saul knows his game very well in mm -hmm. a similar, similar way that Rossi does. So it shouldn't be, it should be less of a problem for him to climb into the next level. Um, there's still unknowns whether he, he will cope. Uh, the ball's going to be moving around, as you said, Huckley Oval. If he does get his chance, it's not going to be easy. But I do think, I think he's better placed than somebody like Hamza, in my personal yes. opinion. Um, yeah. I think Sarwell is a much better place, uh, much more experienced at the level. level. Um, it's also as an individual uh, the other guy that I don't think will play for, because we've just got so many bowlers, but I would quite like if they could find a place for him in this series would be very, very nice, is Clinton Stillman. Yeah. Clinton Stillman is a guy that swings it, natural swinger of the ball, does tend to go for runs from time to time, but he's a wicket taker. He isn't mm. your hold up and end kind of guy. He's a guy that's going to connect to wickets, Caught behind, slip gully, that sort of area. The New Zealand conditions should suit him. So, touch wood, nobody gets injured. But if somebody like Bader or Yudi does get injured, that could be a chance for him then to make a name for himself. Um, mm. He's been doing it for quite a long time now. I, I, I do like him a lot. Do you guys, can you guys see the selectors leaving out Maharaj? If the pitches are green, or do you think they'll just play him regardless? 
they're going to play him regardless. They and are. That's they, they, the level they, of thinking in this team. Yeah. They don't want to top him under any circumstances at all. I don't agree with it, but no. Dean Lincoln defended Keshav Maharaj on a wondrous pitch where he bowled Keshav, I think, less than five overs. No, actually less than three because he didn't bowl in the second less inning. Than three, less than he three still balls. defended him after that game, saying that he still needs all the options. So if Dean wants to have all the options, and that's why I think New Zealand might just pip South Africa because even a guy like Colin de Grandhomme batting at seven is a much more accomplished batter than having a, a, a number seven of a Marco Janssen or a Keshav Maharaj. And I think that's where the series could be won and lost. India matched South Africa pound for pound. India wanted to play with five bowlers. They went in with five bowlers and our, our all-rounders could match them. But I think that's where this series might fall, is in that all-rounder spot. And the only way you can fix it is if you drop Keshav, bring in a seventh uh, batter and have... And Aiden is your pseudo spinner, even though I don't want him in the side, but he becomes your spinner. And then you have your four quicks. And then you pick whichever four quicks you want. I drop Duan and play Glenton. But for me, that's where this series could be lost. And it's going to be lost at selection rather than actually probably even on the field because we're going on with a guy who literally does nothing apart from bat and give us 20 runs. He, he gave us like 40 runs in the one game, but essentially that's what cash up becomes. What's happened with South African cricket over the last few years? Because I remember there was a period where you, you guys would constantly produce all-rounders. It was it was crazy. And, and, and to think at one stage you had Jack Colors and Sean Pollock in the same 11. It just shows you how much flexibility that gives you. Yes. I'll be Tim, you can take that. I always think that Sean um, is one of the most underrated all-rounders. When you think of his yeah, stats. Look, he was having a number nine who can score a century is, is, is unbelievable. Um, just, and to think about yeah. all the guys in front of him. Our spinners could also score runs. Our well, Mark could also score runs at seven. Um, yeah, look, I think that we went through. A, I think the, the twenty kind of made things a little bit because everyone wants to be on one side of the ball, and it's it's, it's the batting side of the ball. Um, and a lot of the great batters um, tend to let go of that art as they go along, which is the which is what I thought the natural progression for Vian Mulder would have been would be that he would focus more on his batting and the bowling would go down. But we've Otis Gibson maybe gave us a gift by trying to force him to work on his bowling first and then work on his batting, but his batting hasn't been there. And so we're trying to find, I don't think we have that type of an all-rounder in the domestic game that can give you what you need. We, we're, we're producing spinning all-rounders, a lot of them, um, like George Linda, who uh, should be on this tour and would have been an option if you wanted to play a spinner. Um, you've also got guys... Oh, hanging, oh, oh. Yeah, oh, and, and oh, also oh. Mutasami, who bats oh, for his franchise and bats better than Keshav. He's got in a half century in India on debut, um, but doesn't bowl too well. So you've got, you've got guys who can do that, but they're not seeming all-rounders, which in South Africa is what you need. Marco Janssen is an interesting one because he could be in that Sean Pollock mold because I think he has the ability at seven to break the game open. And we saw that in, in that India series. We've got a couple of handy 30s there. Yes, like in, in New Zealand, those 30s might not mean much uh, because I'm assuming New Zealand's going to give us a 400 first inning score. And then South is going to try to figure out a way to claw their claw mm -hmm. and get to 400. But it's, it's something. And there's something there with Marco Janssen with the bat as well. Um, which is why I think we might be moving away from Vian in favor of him. And if he can be that all-rounder, that gives us a little bit more balance for having a guy like Kesh out. Interesting that you talk about spinning all-rounders, because I guess when we look at world cricket at the moment, you know, outside of, say, Cameron Green and, you know, Ben Stokes, there's not many, many seeming mm. all-rounders at, at the moment. It kind of just shows you how good Sean Pollock was in, in his prime and, and, and Jack Carlson, a guy averaging 55 with a bat and you know, but you know, average low 30s with the ball, it just changes the whole balance of the side. It gives, mm. you, gives you so many more options, yeah. yeah. So, look, it does. And we've been, we've been looking for one for nine years, and like even even the superstar Jevil Brevis, he bowls leg spin. Like, there's nothing we can do, 
<laughs> um, because the thing about Jacques and the thing about him was that he could make the team as a bowler and as a batter. Um, and, and Cameron Green as well, so to Ben Stokes, so to um, Angelo Matthews, um, batter and a bowler, they could make it in bat in the top six and give you that. And we don't have that. Currently in domestic team, there's nobody who bowls and bats in the top six um, in, our, in, our, in our eight franchises right now, which is really sad. Vian Mulder does that, but uh, he's, he's not the guy. Dwayne Pretorius bats at seven. Um, he's what, an option. What, what we have, in Paul, is we have white ball candidates. We do not have mm. red ball candidates. So mm. you've got your Vian Luba. Opens, opens for the Warriors. Bowls his off spin. He would be a candidate for me going forward. I would try to, mm. if, if I was looking to the future, I would try to move him into that into that position uh, as an option. The problem is we don't have, you know, we've got him. That's that's it. Um, who's the other guy? Um, Tristan Stubbs is, a, is another option. We've got options mm. in the white ball uh, format, Adam. Not, not in the red ball. It's just that yeah. it's, they just they just aren't there. And those guys, they they are focusing on the white ball for a reason because we are playing so much T Twenty cricket. There's T Twenty One cups happening every day. Exactly. So, the, the, so that's an option for them to play for the Proteus. So their mm. focus is all on that. It's not on the longer formats. Funny you talk about the shorter formats. We've got to remember in about a year's time, we've got another fifty over World Cup. Yeah, 18 months' time. That's why we played that nonsensical ODI series against India where everyone was like, where we, where do we place this? Um, we didn't know where to place this. We were like, we have a T20 World Cup in 10 months. The other one's in 18 months, but we're playing ODIs against India. Um, yeah, and it, it is something you need to look, we need to look into. And yeah, I think from a... And even in our, in, in our limited overs, our all-rounders are not that great. They, they, they don't give you... They don't excite me much. And <laughs> that's the that's the sad part about where we are right now in South African cricket is the pipeline's great for bowlers, like out and out bowlers and batters, but but we're trying to convert Kahisa Rabada into a into an all rounder. So if he does score a half century at Hagley Oval, don't be surprised. Because you know Soweto Lara can do that. He has that in his locker. I'm really excited to see Rabada bowl. It's phenomenal to think about how many wickets he's got and how young he still mm. is. Yeah, it's, he's, he's he's been the great thing about everybody retiring. I think you spoke about it earlier. Everyone retiring, everyone going away, is that Kahiso came in at the right time because that's what's keeping this team competitive. Without Kahiso, this team is not competitive at all. Um, because you need someone who you can throw the ball to and give you a spell of three wickets. Um, and, and like you're talking about Trent Bolt, he hasn't bowled, the guy hasn't bowled well um, over the past two, three years, but he has bowled, he is the guy I will throw the ball to every time I need a wicket, similar to Trent Bolt. He just has a knack of breaking partnerships open, of doing all the right things. And then everyone else feeds off of that. You know, even if you look at that, um, in Newlands, when Kohli, when Gidi took those three wickets, Kahiso led um, the beginning of that of that session with his battle with Kohli. And then when Gidi came in on the other end, it became like it just helped Gidi get all those three wickets, three wickets for like nine runs and like four overs. It was just ridiculous how how he opened up that series. But it, it, that's what you want from him, and and it's a it's a blessing that. With all of these retirements, we still have a world-class bowling tag that we can travel the world with. Like, even after the series, we're going to go to England. And that's what's going to keep us in the series. There's nothing else that keeps us in the series. And then our batters need a claw and whatever, fight their way to whatever number they can get. And then the bowlers will just have to uh, defend with their lives. And they've done that against India. Um, and I think they can do that in New Zealand too. Yeah. It's basically been us for four years. Four years we've been putting all emphasis on the bowling. Yeah. Um, but Adam, I just want to say thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think we're going to be very excited um, to watch this test series unfold, even though it's like in the dead of night for us. Um, but we will wake up <laughs> and we will watch. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much again for joining us. And yeah, all the best for the series, all the best to New Zealand. And yeah, we will chat again, hopefully, at the back end of the series 
trying to see if you're licking your wounds or we are just as angry and frustrated as we've always been over the past six months. I, I covered myself by saying it was going to be one all. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, it could be 2 0 to South Africa. That could be a surprise. <laughs> it, could, it could be. We're going to wait yeah. and see. Yes, but well, thank you very longer. much, Adam. Thanks yes. very much, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, All Adam. Best. God bless. Bye. Cheers, man. Tim, one last word on your team that's in New Zealand. What's your starting 11 on that on Thursday? So the starting 11 is going to be, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pick Maharaj because he's just going to play. So, I mean, so, I mean what's, he's going to play. He's going to play. Oh, he's, going, he's going to play. But Sarl for Markram. Sarl, oh, for Markram. Yeah. I know, you... that they, I know that they said that, uh, that, that 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 would happen. So what I would make is, is the is the two changes. Hamza so comes so in. Ham, Hamza comes in for Keegan. Sarah comes in for Markram. I'm so confused. You're dropping the chosen one. Yeah. You're dropping him. Drop you heard it here first, guys. Stop. You heard it here first on the full quota. Tim is dropping Aiden Markram. Uh, I was going I, to do that. And, but, and I, okay. just, 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 I say that. Because I've been saying on this podcast for I don't know how many weeks not to move Markham. I can't go around now go, no, let's move Markham. So I've got to stick to okay. that that mantra. That... Okay. So why do I have why do I have always faith in this guy? Okay, I'm keeping Aiden. I'm opening with Sorrel. I'm batting Aiden at three. If Aiden does well, then he can he, it, it bodes well for South Africa. He can go back to number one. But that's my thing. I'm dropping Keshav. I'm done with this whole spinner talk. Aiden can bowl spin if Dean wants spin. If Dean wants to, if, we, if we're in that much trouble, Dean can bowl himself. So Ma, Maharaj out, Duan out too. So I've got three changes. Obviously, Keen Peterson out, Sarl in. Maharaj out for Glenton Steelman. Nokia out. And no, not Nokia. Uh, Olifir out for Rickleton. So Ryan's going to bat at seven, um, and we're going to have a very – seven batters, four bowlers, and that's how I play this series. Both games give Rickleton two games to see what he is. But obviously, guys, you know, when I pick this thing, Mark Bouch is going to tell you that Rickleton's the backup wicketkeeper. So in that case, Maharaj in for Rickleton, and then we have a spinner – and you also have Glenton. But Duan Olifia out for Glenton Stephen. I'm sorry. I've seen enough. I'm, I'm comfortable now that we've given him that opportunity. He's broken records in South Africa. And we thank him for it. I thank him for it because I'm a Lions supporter. But I've, I'm done. I'm, I don't want to give him, I, like, unless in this next week he can push it up to 140. There's no need to, for me to have him there. I've got Lungi who's going to bowl it full and outside often and, and get it to swing away. And if I need someone else to do that, I'll get... I'll get Glinton to do that. I've got Marco as well. I need you to be the enforcer. I need you to be the enforcer. If you're not going to be the enforcer, I'm going to get someone else who's going to do the job for you. So I'll get Marco to be my enforcer. Kakiso there. And then that's how I'm going to play it. But I wouldn't drop Aiden now. I don't know why. I don't want him in the team. I really don't. Okay, so you don't want him in the team and you might drop him. What's, what, what, what's, no, what's the going on? Like because Keegan Peterson's out. So I don't want two debutants or two guys in there. So you've got Sarl and Zubair who between the two of them, have one test match. At least with Aiden, he scored 100 before. You can just oh, do the same thing they've done with him in, in, against India, but, like, hope he's going to score. He's been there for that long. He's probably, he's bound, he's due a big score, and that's the only reason why. I just can't have so many debutants at the top, because then you've got, so, imagine if Dean Alga gets out. You know, you've got Sarl and you've got Zubair trying to make their way in international cricket. Zubair's trying to question whether he's still good enough for this team, and so he's going to be very tentative. Sorrell's is on debut, fielding Salvi and Jameson and, and, and Wagner trying to get through that. And it, it could work, but that already exposes Temba and Rassi and everybody else and kind of defeats the purpose of why we're there to win cricket games. So if Keegan Peterson was there, I'd drop Mark. That's what I would do. But because he's not there, I, 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 there's no point. I'd, I'd rather just be like, look, Go to first job, see how long these two can can last, 
and then you can come in maybe when the ball's a little bit less uh, new and then uh, and, and less swingy, and then we can figure out what we do with you. But um, for England, yes, drop it if Sarrell does well here. Um, but essentially, they're both fighting for the opener spot next to Dina Alga in this series, and that's how I'm, I would build it. So yeah. whoever scores the most runs is our open for England, and then Keegan Pearson comes back at three, and we're, we're good. But I understand Zubair's waiting in the wings. The only way Zubair can play, I think, is if, is, is, is if they decide that they still want to keep the opening combination and that they want a specialist number three, which we do have specialist number threes in, in the world, and you can do that, and that's, and that's Zubair, but he's only played one test. Yeah. And I, 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 I don't think they will pick him. I, I think, because they said at the press conference, anyway, they said that, mm. uh, he said that along the lines of, Sarlo deserves his crack, and if it happens, yes. it'll be a three. They said yes. something along, the, along those lines. So it'll be, it'll be him for, for Keegan. Um, yeah. But anyway, I'm yeah. so excited for Sarlo that that's the case. Really, really yeah. excited for Sarlo. He's been waiting for an injury or something like this to happen, and it happened to be COVID. So, all the best to Sorrel. Um, and yeah, all the best to the protest. Hopefully you can um, give us a 2-0 win and make us believe we can make it to that World Test Championship final. But Tim, thank you very much again. Um, we'll be back next week to discuss the Momentum protest um, as they prepare for the World Cup. Outside of that, thank you very much. Goodbye, good night. Remember, you can subscribe to our channel. We will be broadcasting the um, New Zealand series. It might be on Guerrilla SA, but we'll... Uh, just watch out and listen out on Twitter and all the, all the social media channels. But for myself and Paul and Tim, bye and um, God bless. And the Saleh, Kakafiso.